I just want to start by thanking the conference organizers and sponsors for inviting me to participate uh, and congratulate them on integrating uh, or putting together such a well-integrated program. OK, so let me dive right in with a brief introduction and a sort of executive summary of what we're doing here. There's a lot of anomalies. And by anomalies, just to be clear, I'm talking about rejections of conventional asset pricing models, notably the CAPM and FAMA French three-factor model. Uh, my former colleague Cam Harvey and a couple of co-authors counted 314, but I've heard anywhere between 100 and 400. The point is there are a lot. And the question that we're going to tackle in this paper is what's behind these anomalies? What economic mechanism is driving these violations of asset pricing models? And broadly speaking, we can think of three explanations, two based on model misspecification, so unmodeled risk or mispricing. And then a slightly more nefarious explanation based on data snooping. And our empirical strategy to get at this question is to exploit a new comprehensive database of containing accounting information for publicly traded firms in the US going back actually to 1918. All right. So the way, the way to think about the paper and the data that we're going to be using here is three eras. There's a, a, a period of data that occurs before the period that was used to discover an anomaly, be it investment, profitability, or whatever. There's the in-sample period in which the anomaly was actually discovered. And then there's a post-sample period that comes after the end of the in-sample period in which the anomaly was found. Okay? All right. And so let me give you the, the key findings and then the economic takeaways. So, so the, the glass is three-quarters empty findings is 78% of the anomalies we look at completely disappear in terms of economic and statistical significance in the pre-sample and post-sample periods. So when I'm talking about disappear, I'm talking about sharp ratios, alphas, and information ratios all decrease dramatically, while volatility and covariation ramps up once you move out of sample either back in time or forward in time. This includes investment and profitability, as you'll see. If you think about the sharp ratio of a five-factor strategy, Prior to 1963, it's about the same as that of the market, right around 0.5. And so what we ultimately go on to show is that it's not just a matter of looking at the first half of the 20th century in which most anomalies seem to disappear. If you actually tweak the in-sample period by just a couple of years, the anomalies all but disappear. Now, the, the, the glass is one quarter full is that 22% of the anomalies survive out of sample. And since we're looking at 36, that's a fair number of anomalies. Earlier in the 20th century, anomalies related to real investment, and when I say real investment, think inventory or capital expenditures, and equity financing, as well as distress and, and returns, or at least accounting returns, seem to be most prominent. If we look at the second half of the 20th century, and actually more towards uh, the last 15, 20 years, it's really anomalies related to sales and earnings and total financing or debt financing that seems to seem to be persisting. Economically, what does this mean? Those are sort of the basic facts. And there's three broad takeaways we, we, we want to convey in this paper. First, we're able to, loosely speaking, quantify data snooping concerns. E even so-called robust anomalies are not so robust once you move out of sample. Uh, the data snooping problem is actually so severe that under relatively conservative assumptions, we undertake a simple thought experiment. The true asset pricing model would be expected to be rejected in sample. And the bigger problem is that in sample corrections to address things like multiple, multiple hypothesis testing are imperfectly correlated with results we find out of sample. In other words, there still exist size distortions after adjusting for multiple hypothesis testing. Second, the anomaly survival across different eras actually shows a very interesting economic pattern. If you think about the first half of our sample, the first half of the 20th century, investment really was primarily based in physical capital buildup. And interestingly, anomalies tied to that physical capital buildup, be it through inventory or PP&E, are what are most prominent. But when we move to the second half of our sample where there's a shift from tangible investment to intangibles, think R&D, uh, think some marketing spend, patents, the, and the like, 
It's anomalies that are related to this intangible investment and debt financing that become much more prominent. And finally, there's an interesting paper put, uh, that came out in the JF uh, a year ago by McLean and Pontiff that argues what's, what's going on with anomalies is that once academic research identifies them or they get publicly revealed, investors trade on them. This leads to a reduction in the associated premium and an increase in the covariation among anomalies. And we're actually going to show that that, that uh, conclusion is a bit premature. There's really no power to distinguish that sort of learning hypothesis from a simple data snooping story. So that's the executive summary. Let, let me start, dive into the data. The data is relatively standard except for the diamond-shaped bullet point. So in, in 2001, um, we started on a data collection process by taking all of the Moody's manuals from 1918 to 1970 and encoding them. So what we did is we shipped them off to India for a year and outsourced it. Okay. Yeah, big data, <laughs> painful data. Okay, it came back a year later, we got all the data, and then we spent the next seven years cleaning it. <laughs> because what happens is, right, th there's no standardization for Moody's financial statements. Companies just report however they want using any account name they want. There is no SG&A that is consistent across all reports. So what you have to do is look at the income statement and the balance sheet for every company year and encode it into standardized accounts. So th that took a while. There are some limitations. We don't have information on financial firms or utilities, uh, partly because the original impetus for the uh, data collection was somewhat different for, than an asset pricing approach, but also because we ran out of money. So, so financials and utilities are in different sets of manuals. The data is also slightly more aggregated than what you might find in traditional databases, such as CompuStat. We don't have information on R&D expenditures or SG&A. Uh, so that's yet another limitation that we address in the paper. In terms of the data quality, it's as good as we can figure it out to be. So we've done a number of checks in this paper, as well as an, a host of additional checks for different reasons in earlier research I've done using this data. Um, but time will tell. Here's a snapshot to give you an idea of what we're adding to conventional databases. And when I say conventional databases, I'm talking about standard enforced CompuStat. And I want you to focus your attention on the uh, dotted line at the bottom. That is the number of firms. This is telling you the number of firms covered by S&P's CompuStat. And you can see the first dashed line, right around 1963, is really where CompuStat becomes usable because CompuStat came about in large part because of equity analyst demand. So it was released in 63, and what S&P did is they backfilled data for really large, successful firms that the analysts wanted to follow. So most of that often gets excluded. Now the dashed line is CompuStat plus Moody's, and you can see the number of firms we're adding is, is quite significant in the first half of the century, but actually continues to add a significant amount to what we have in CompuStat all the way through 1970, until there's finally just complete overlap and, and consistent coverage by CompuStat. So let me use profitability and investment, the profitability and investment factors, as an illustrative vehicle before generalizing to the other 34 anomalies that we look at in this paper. So what we're going to do throughout most of the paper, though there's an, a large appendix that does seemingly everything everybody else wants us to do, is we're going to create HML-like factors. So this is just Fama French 93, I think. And if, so if you think about investment, we're going to form six portfolios and, find a, and form a high minus low investment factor, so a long short portfolio along the high and low dimensions averaged across size. And the reason we're going to focus on this is to deal is primarily to mitigate concerns about small cap and micro cap firms dominating our results. Okay? We look at other, uh, other metrics based on one-way sorts, uh, Fama Macbeth regressions, that's all in the appendix, which seems to be larger than the paper at this point. So let me give you some, some results. All right, and I'm going to work from right to left. So if you look at the rightmost column, this is in sample for profitability and investment. And you can see that the monthly factor return runs about 28 and 26 basis points for the two factors. They're highly statistically significant and economically large as well. If we move left one column, 
you see a sharp attenuation in both factors from the 26 to 63 period. Okay? If we bifurcate that early period into two sub-periods, you can see it doesn't matter how we cut it, the monthly factor premium are largely gone and statistically zero. And the reason we're bifurcating it along the 1938 year is because of the Security Exchange Act that was passed in 34 that gives us a little bit more confidence beyond what we already have in our data post-38. There was a two-year uh, phase-in period, and then, of course, there's a holding period issue. If we look at CAPM alphas by the same periods, you get a somewhat similar result, right? The rightmost column shows large and significant CAPM alphas that attenuate both economically and significantly in the pre-era, though the attenuation is smaller for the top factor, which is profitability. The bottom one is investment. And then finally, if we look at Fama French three-factor alphas, it's yet another another take on the same story, though I do want to draw your attention to the 38 to 63 period and the profitability factor. That's RM, RMW for short. You can see that that's actually statistically significant. And so th this is where Yohani and I argue a lot. He says this is significant, and it's certainly economically large, but given the number of hypothesis tests we're taking, it's, it's not really clear two is the correct cutoff. Nonetheless, it is economically large, but investment is completely gone, no matter how we look at it. Now, in light of the previous, the, the, the talk before the break, this shouldn't be surprising. The world changed. It changes all the time, and it changed a lot, certainly over the 20th century. And nothing makes that more clear than these two pictures, which show temporal variation in the cross-sectional distribution of the underlying characteristics between, behind the profitability and investment factors. You can see changes in the distribution. What I'm showing you are de decile breakpoints for each characteristic over the last 100 years. And you can see not just the first moment, but higher order moments are changing over time. You would expect factor premia to potentially change for a variety of reasons. And so the second half of the paper is trying to take this variation seriously in order to distinguish between the potential explanations for the disappearance that we're seeing in the pre-sample era. So let me sort of blow this out now to, the, to what John Cochran calls the, the rest of the zoo, right? So we're gonna look at 36 anomalies, and I don't want you to read this. Uh, it's there for you to take a glimpse and see broadly what we're talking about. There's your glimpse, let's move on. We look at a bunch of them. Let me instead just summarize the punchline from looking at all of these different anomalies. In sample, not surprisingly, every single anomaly we look at has a, an economically and statistically large CAPM alpha or Fama French three-factor alpha. Okay, hence the name anomaly. When we look before, in the, in the period before they were discovered, only eight Anomalies, eight out of the 36, have an average return that's meaningfully different from zero, or a cap M alpha that's different from zero. And 16 have a Fama French three factor alpha that's different from zero. If we go forward in time and look post discovery, only one average return has a meaningfully different uh, estimate from zero 10 cap M alphas and nine Fama French three factor alphas. The picture to keep in mind, if I could draw it here, is, is sort of a, an upside down U, right? Before these anomalies are found, they're small, most are small and insignificant. Then the in-sample period, when they're discovered, they're large and significant. And then after that discovery, they're small and insignificant. And to highlight this sort of picture, if I average the anomalies and block bootstrap the SE is just to deal with the cross-sectional dependence, you can see this really clearly, right? So in sample, the middle column there, the average anomaly is, is just screamingly large and significant. But either before or after, there's a big drop in the magnitude of that anomaly, right? The average return and the sharp ratio, okay? And if you look at this statistically, the differences statistically, it just confirms what you can see in the average returns. So pre-post, pre and post, they're zero and they're not really different from one another, or close to zero. And again, it doesn't matter if we look at out cap M alphas and information ratios, or we look at uh, three-factor alphas and information ratios, 
all of the action is really happening in sample. Something is very different out of sample. Now, what that means is yet to be determined, but this is just sort of the empirical facts. All right. So let's turn to the second half of the paper, which is really, what does this mean? Why do we see this temporal variation? Okay. And right, you, you could imagine a lot of alternative interpretations without much thought, frankly. This is just a, a manifestation of unmodeled risks. So structural breaks in the risks that matter to investors, that leads to sort of the movement in and out of different anomalies. Maybe this is just mispricing. Maybe it's transient fads that investors glom onto for a while and release. Okay? Or maybe, according to McLean and Pontiff, what's going on is that investors are learning and they're trading against this and driving them out through their trading activity once they've been exposed. Okay? And so what I want to do now is try and make some headway in distinguishing these explanations from one another as well as from a data snooping interpretation. So what, what we're going to do now is we're really going to refine the take I've just given you. Okay? What I want to do now is exploit asynchronicity in the sample periods that researchers have used to identify anomalies. Right? So, so gross profitability was, was, was discovered over the period 63 to 2010. Okay? And 63 is the start date because, as I mentioned earlier, that's when CompuStat was free of backfill bias. Return on assets was discovered from 79 to 93, profit margin 84 to 2002, and so on and so on and so on. And so it's this asynchronicity in the windows that I want to get at in the following manner. I want to know what happens if I ex extend the start date of the in-sample period used in the original study by just a few years, okay? What happens to the anomaly return? What happens to the anomalies cap M alpha or from a French three-factor alpha? If I just pull it back a little bit. And so let me show you. If I start, instead of going back to 1926, instead I draw the sample back just to 1963. And I look at average returns across all the anomalies and I sweep out anomaly fixed effects. So it is a within anomaly estimate that I'm looking at here. You can see that in, right, in sample, that's beta naught. In sample, the anomaly average returns about 30 basis points per month. It's big and it's significant. But the beta one measures the decline in the anomaly once I go back a little bit. And you can see the anomaly drops by 50%, 15 basis points. And that's quite significant. Now, 1963 is kind of arbitrary other than the fact that it's coincides with CompuStat, okay? So we look at a host of different potential start dates from 63 all the way up to 1973. And the punchline is you don't have to bring back the in, you don't have to bring back the start date of the in sample or the estimation sample to basically eliminate the anomaly result, right? Average returns decline between 40% and 80% just pulling back the in sample start date by a few years. If we look at cap M alphas, they decline between 50 and 75%. And so, right, you may be worried about um, covariation with the market. If you're worried about covariation with size and value as well, Fama French three-factor alphas decline between 30% and 90%. After running this, it kind of begs the question, why did researchers pick the starting date they chose? Because if I go back to this picture, Right. I can measure return on assets back to 1963 with CompuStat. You don't need our larger data set. Same thing with profit margin. And Chris is smiling at me. It's not a nefarious reason, I like to believe, but it's more, if you read the, all of the original papers, it seems to be a desire to maintain a uniform in-sample start date because they're bringing in different data sources that have different limitations that thing, what CompuStat faces. But nonetheless, the reality is small perturbations to the in-sample start date do have a meaningful effect on the magnitude and significance of so-called anomalies. The other thing this actually this, I wanted to say about this analysis is it, it makes the structural break story and the transient fad story a little bit harder to tell. 
right? The world certainly changed around 1963, the, the late 60s, when a lot of these anomalies were beginning to be measured, at least the start of their in-sample period, right? Uh, I mean, there was a large fiscal expansion. That, that was Kennedy and Johnson. Um, and so there was a lot going on. But, but what, this paper, what, what this table is showing, what this analysis is showing, is it's not about how the world changed in a particular uh, decade or a particular five-year era. It's that the world would have to change in a very specific manner virtually every year and only affect certain anomalies in a specific way, which makes things a little bit more tenuous for this alternative. The second thing we do is we try to understand this McLean and Pontiff result. So with the, with their, one of their key results, it's, it's actually a wonderful paper, one of their key results is that they're showing that when anomalies move from in-sample to out-of-sample, the covariation among, among anomalies ramps up significantly. Okay. And their interpretation is that now everybody's trading on all of these anomalies because they're now public information. And so what they do is they run this regression I've put up there. And rather than spending a lot of time discussing all of the coefficients, what really matters is that beta 5 coefficient, which is an indicator for the post-sample, right, after the discovery period, times a post-sample index, which is an index of all the anomalies, all their returns, except for the ith anomaly in the post-sample. So let me show you the results and take a look at the red square. What the red square shows you is a really big, significant, positive number. What, what that's telling you is that the covariation among an anomaly and all the other anomalies, once they're out of sample, it's much higher. And their interpretation is exactly what I said, right? Now everybody knows about the anomaly. Everybody's trading on them. Correlation is ramping up. Okay. And so the conclusion is that, well, loosely speaking, academic research seems to aid in the, de the death of anomalies. But with our data going back to 1926, we can do a counterfactual experiment. We can ask the question, well, instead of looking how anomaly covariation changes once you move forward in time, after the discovery of the anomaly, what, what happens to the covariation among anomalies if you go back in time, before they're discovered? In this case, it, it can't be that people learn about the anomaly and then trade together and covariation goes up because the anomaly hasn't been discovered yet. So let me, let me replace post in this regression everywhere with pre. And let's see what happens to that beta 5 coefficient. It's identical. So this regression doesn't tell us about learning and increased covariation as a, as a result of that learning. What it tells us is actually there, there's a factor structure to returns, and when you average a lot of them, it removes some noise, and the correlation ramps up. So th this is actually a bit mechanical, this specification. Um, we discuss it in the paper, but if you're unsure, just look at the size of the t-stats. Something's off. That's just not probabilistically possible. Now. We're clearly not the only ones to suggest a data snooping explanation. And there's been some recent work uh, by Cam Harvey and others, as well as old work um, by one of my colleagues, Craig McKinley, as well as econometricians. Right? The idea is maybe we can address data snooping by recognizing the multiple hypothesis testing problem. Right? We can get around size distortions, okay, loosely speaking, by just inflating T value thresholds, okay? So instead of two being the cutoff, 1.96, the cutoff for sig statistical significance, maybe it should be three, okay? All right, well, we, 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 can, we can do that, and we can actually apply that threshold to all of our tests, and then compare that with how anomalies perform out of sample, a sort of litmus test, if you will. And so the leftmost column here the flower is identifying significant anomalies pre-sample. The second column does a multiple hypothesis correction by saying the only way an anomaly can be legitimate or real in sample is if its in-sample t-statistic 
is greater than or equal to three. And this comes out of the, uh, the, one of Cam Harvey's recent studies. And then we can look not at the union. That's a typo. That's an intersection. We can look at the intersection. And you can see that the overlap be between what we identify as uh, quote unquote real anomaly using out of sample data is actually somewhat different from what CAM or others would identify as a real anomaly using an in-sample statistical adjustment. And actually, you can compute, right? It's very simple to compute the type 1 and type 2 error rates here of 30% and 26%, which is troubling, right? That's quite troubling. Those are large size or power distortions, ultimately. And so do in-sample adjustments work? Maybe not really is too strong, but maybe the jury's out on that one, OK? And so one of the takeaways from this is really that statistics is only going to take you so far in getting around data snooping, right? Especially when the publication process is such that researchers are not required to report all the tests we run, right? Not every test makes it into the published paper. Not to mention the fact all the papers that don't get published. So statistical adjustments have their limitations. And let me just give you the following. So half empty, that's, that's generous. Uh, let, let's say three quarters empty view of our paper is the data snooping problem's really severe. Okay, we, we, we all knew data snooping's an issue, but once you actually quantify it on a, on a, on a broader scale, it, it's actually pretty severe. Uh, and the problem is in sample statistical adjustments are not a panacea, okay? Rather, we really have to rely on out of sample testing even if that's holdout samples, given the data limitations we face in our studies. The, the one quarter full interpretation is right. I, there, there are eight or so, depending on how you measure it, anomalies that seem to persist over very long periods of time, or well, relatively long periods of time. And there are these persistent violations of AP models, asset pricing models. And the nice thing is they're correlated with economic fund fundamentals, at least at first glance, in an interestingly insensible way. And so what this, this agenda has really started us out on is, is the next paper, which is, well, what's the right model? Okay. If a lot of these anomalies are just data snooped, what is the right model over the last, now that we have data, last 130 some odd years? And more importantly, how does that model relate to economic fundamentals? What are the economic me mechanisms responsible for asset price formation. And that's the next paper that's currently under progress. So I look forward to my discussants comments and thank you for your time. Uh, as you can hear, I'm English and bitter, so I would go with <laughs> <laughs> the English and bitter is sort of redundant, right, the second one. <laughs> I'd say the glass is eh, not even half empty. It's, it's pretty worrying. And it ought to be worrying not just to academics, but to practitioners as well. Because when you look, I know uh, Michael didn't show the table for too long, but when you look at those lists of 34 anomalies, a lot of places are using variants of those anomalies even now. Smart beta funds certainly have variants of those running. Uh, so if it's all data snooping, what's going on? Uh, is this luck? Are we just getting lucky for a few years and then it's all going to wipe away? Uh, it's, it's possible. Uh, but it's a problem. So what I'm going to do is focus on, for me, there's two key parts to this paper. There's the pre-sample period results, and then there's the post-sample period results. Everything else doesn't really matter to me for, for the time being. I'm going to start, though, with the post-sample, largely because it's easier to deal with. So post-sample, most of the anomalies, almost all of the anomalies, in fact, disappear or weaken. Is it data snooping? Yeah, certainly it could be data snooping. Uh, but there's some other options, right? So it's quite possible that people trade on these anomalies. And in trading, they wipe away the profits. Uh, so there's two alternatives there. One is what I'd call exploited alpha, which is where industry practitioners generate the alpha idea originally, and then it slowly transfers to academia. And then there's the other approach, which is the exploitable alpha, where the, the idea comes from academia, and then it gets incorporated into industry. An example of the former 
would be something like sales to price. So in academia, we use a study in 1996 to say that's when sales to price became an anomaly. But Bruce Jacobs and Ken Levy back in 1988 published a paper looking at the cross-section of returns, and they had sales to price there. So in industry, it was widely known back in the mid-'80s, but in academia, it only became known later. So it could easily have been traded away by the time the academics started to look at it. Uh, an example of exploitable alpha would be accruals. So before Sloan's paper, industry didn't really know much about accruals. Uh, as soon as they found out, they traded on it. Now, can we see this? So can we get at this, right? We've got data snooping, and then we've got traders trading to get rid of alpha. Can we actually see this in the data? Can we try and tease it out? Well, here's uh, a plot. Uh, this comes from a paper by Cedarberg and O'Doherty uh, in the Journal of Econometrics. And what they're looking at here, this is accruals. And they're looking at the relationship between firm alphas and accruals. And in the pre-period, so on the left-hand side, this is the pre-publication period, you can see that for big firms, for small firms, and for microcap firms, there's a robust negative relationship between alpha and accruals, exactly what Sloan found. Post-publication, though, things change. So this is the right-hand graph. Now you can see that for, for the big firms, there's nothing there. There's no relationship anymore. For the small firms, uh, the relationship's weakened. But for the micro-cap firms, relationship's just the same. Nothing's changed. And those are the firms where the transaction costs are greatest. Institutional investors really can't trade those. So you know, this is a way to tease out, is it data snooping, or is it the fact people are trading on these anomalies? So it seems we could do a little more work to get at whether we're data snooping or whether it's being traded. So now I want to shift, though, to the more troubling area, which is the pre-sample performance. Like, nothing works. These anomalies just don't work. Could just be data snooping. Uh, it really could be. But I want to see if there's any other explanations, and I'm going to take you through one possibility today. So I'm going to start with statistical power. So if you were designing a test, suppose you want to look at asset growth, and you want to test this anomaly. What would you look for in your sample? Well, you'd want a nice long time series, Right, because we know anomalies are volatile through month to month. So over time, if we've got a nice long average, we can get a true picture of what's going on with this anomaly. But we'd also like a nice broad cross-section. We don't want asset growth numbers for all firms to be similar. We want them spread out so we can clearly identify the low asset growth firms, the high asset growth firms. We don't want them muddled up in the middle. So what do we have in the data that Michael's been using. Well, here is the plot uh, from figure two in their paper. And I've highlighted the pre-sample period and the in-sample period. What happened here, right, this is the percentiles. Michael showed it earlier. Basically, you're looking at the distribution of asset growth through time. And if the contour lines are closer together, the distribution is more focused. So there's not as much dispersion. And what you can see is that pre-sample, there's very little dispersion in asset growth. And then, miraculously, when you get into the in-sample period, the cross-sectional dispersion in asset growth ramps up. It's incredible. It's almost five times larger at one point. So what happens if you have a long time series? We have a long time series in the pre-sample period, 1925 to 1960 something. We've got a long period of time. but the cross-sectional variation may not be great. So what happens in this type of setting? So I want to take you through a, sort of a thought experiment. In this pre-sample period, we have a pretty small number of firms. We start with about 350. We finish with 700 by 1960. Uh, I would argue that the data is likely to be collected more for large firms. Uh, you may say, well, why, why would it be biased towards large firms? Well, even today, if you look at CompuStat and say it's the earnings season and you've got IBM reporting its 10Ks, the data vendors 
get a move on when it's IBM. But if there's a microcap firm reporting on the same day, the data vendors, Cap IQ, CompuStat, they're quite happy to say, let's defer that one. Let's just deal with the big firms first and push the small firms into the future. Maybe it's a couple of days later, or maybe it's a week later. So if we have that bias now, we're likely to have had that bias 80, 90 years ago, or 100 years ago, when the costs of data acquisition were much more expensive. Right? It was really hard to get hold of data back then. Uh, so who would you acquire data about? Typically, the larger firms that investors are more interested in. So could the number of firms in this pre-sample period, and then the type of the firms, larger firms than typical, could this help explain the pre-period results? How can we test this? So what I'm going to propose is a strategy to try and get at this. And we're going to use the in-sample period, which is typically something from 1960-something to, I don't know, 1990 or 2000. Why use the in-sample period? Well, we know the anomalies work, for sure. There's strong evidence that they work. But what we're going to do is randomly sample just a small number of firms in each month. Rather than use 3,000 or 6,000 firms, let's use 700. That's the most that was in that pre-sample period. So let's just use a small number of firms. And what we'll do each time is we'll calculate the anomaly returns and the t-statistics, and we'll repeat this experiment a 1,000 times. We could even go a little further. What happens if you randomly sample from a pool of larger firms, which is where we think this sample's drawing from in the pre-sample period? So to do this, we need to take a very quick trip to the data. Uh, so disclaimer, you can't really compare what I'm doing to what is reported in the paper. I have different data sources. I'm using CompuStat for the annual accounting data and for returns. There's a bunch of details that are slightly different between what I'm doing and what Mike's been doing. Uh, I'm including utilities and financials, for example. Uh, so what I want to do is look at four anomalies. I'm going to look at book to market, asset growth, net stock issues, and gross profit. Just to check I've got this data reasonably well organized, here's what happens if I calculate equally weighted long short portfolios. All these anomalies in the, let's see, in the left hand side, you've got long short returns, everything looks great. On the right hand side, you've got T stats, everything's looking great. These anomalies are all working and they're robust. So what would you expect if we switch to a smaller sample where we randomly sample 700 firms each month? Well, actually, since we're sampling from all the firms that are available, we'd expect on average to see something similar. We may get the odd bad draw where a strategy doesn't work so well or it works really well, but on average, it should be very close to this. So what do we see? Well, here's the distribution of average returns for these strategies. And they are exactly in line with what you'd expect. So they're focused around the numbers that I just gave you on the previous slide. So can this explain partially what we see in the pre-sample period? Uh, not really. Because, yeah, you could have a bad draw, right? You can have a very low, so book to market could be down at 0.5 or 0.45. But what he's finding in the paper is that all anomalies, not just one or two, all 30-odd anomalies are shrinking. We can't get that from this. It just doesn't work. So it's not the number of firms in the sample that's, that's driving anything. If we look at T statistics very quickly, you can see everything stays robust. So you think, well, where's, where's this going? Well, let's shift a little bit towards larger firms. So suppose instead of sampling from the full cross-section, where we have 3,000 or 6,000 firms in a month, suppose we limit ourselves to the largest 1,500. And then we sample randomly 700 firms each month from the largest 1,500 each month. What happens if we do that? So here are the results. The blue bars are plotting the distributions when we sample from all firms. That's the previous slides. The red plots are showing what happens when we sample from the larger firms, 
So you can see that for book to market, asset growth, net stock issues, when we start sampling from these large firms, the anomalies don't do so well. This is in sample. Right? We know the anomalies work. We know they're very strong. Total, uh, sorry, asset growth, huge T statistics. But when we start sampling from just this large group of firms, things don't look so good. But you will see gross profit. Gross profit seems to do slightly better. See, if I'd been data mining, I wouldn't have reported gross profit, because gross profit goes against what I'm saying. Uh, if I look at t-statistics, so the black line for t-statistics reports t-statistic of two, you can see book to market still marginally significant, asset growth no longer significant, net stock issues not significant, but gross profit, yeah, seems to be holding up. So what I find is I've got three out of the four anomalies that I've looked at have significant tail-offs in their performance if you start to look at slightly larger firms which is consistent with the data set that we'd expect to see in the pre-period. Uh, some more evidence about that pre-period, because it's important. Uh, Chris actually has a paper uh, on two centuries of momentum. And the interesting bit for me is how many firms you have in the sample. Uh, back in 1926, Chris has 800 firms, or 790 firms in 1926, that are traded in the US. In this study, we have 345 in that same period. So what are we missing? It's likely to be those small firms, because they're just not worth capturing. OK, I've got to wrap up pretty quickly. Uh, but one last thing. Remember how we talked about the cross-sectional dispersion? We wanted big cross-sectional dispersion to have a good test. Well, what happens to the breakpoints? We had a 70-30 breakpoint when we're forming our portfolios. What happened when we shifted from all firms, when we sample all firms, to when we sample just the largest, 700, uh, largest 1,500 firms? So when we condition on the size, what do we see? Well, we see, this is quite stark, the reduction in the breakpoints as we go towards more large firms. Book to market, the spread has collapsed 15%. Asset growth has collapsed a similar amount. But it's weird. Gross profit barely changed. The breakpoints when you sample from all firms versus when you sample from just the larger firms, pretty much unchanged. So to wrap up, pre-sample, undoubtedly, some anomalies are pure data snooping. But I think we've got to be careful before we rush to condemn all of these anomalies. Uh, some of these negative results, I hope I've managed to convince you, or at least raise a question in your mind, maybe it's driven by the structure of the data and the sample that we have in this pre-sample period. Post-sample, you know, it would be interesting to actually tease out who's doing what. Is it academics driving industry, or is it industry driving academics? It'd be really interesting to get at this, and I think we can. We could be looking at changing the ending date not just the start date that Michael did, but the ending date. If it was traded by practitioners first, we might expect to see anomaly profits decreasing before the end of that sample period, because the practitioners already traded it. Uh, so I think this, it's a really fun area, and that's everything I've got. Bill, thank you very much for the feedback. Uh, I'd rather leave more time for comments, so let me, let me keep this very brief. So in the pre-sample era, firms are relatively large, almost by construction of the data collection process. So it's, most, it's NYSE firms. Um, now that said, we, we, we condition the in-sample period to restrict to NYSE listed firms and then S&P 500 firms. And you see similar drop-offs, but the drop-offs moderate somewhat, consistent with, with what with your small sample evidence, nonetheless, Another way to interpret what you showed is that what were anomalies are, are not anomalies, they're small firm anomalies, which is certainly perfectly consistent with what we're trying to get at here. Very good, let's open up for questions and comments. This is just a question. If you look at some of the innovations taking place in both machine learning and artificial intelligence, how would that, or how do you think that might impact uh, the the discussion of, of anomalies. 
Michael? Uh, Good question. You, you go first, first, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Having a corporate finance guy prognosticate <laughs> on asset pricing innovation is dangerous. Uh, but um, so, so l let me keep it brief and, and temper what I'm about to say. But uh, I worry more about sort of the disconnect, potential disconnect from economic fundamentals that other people have touched on today. And so if I, th if I think about machine learning approaches, which actually is something we're doing in the follow-on paper to try and pin down, well, what is the right model uh, across this larger sample frame, recognizing the dangers of overfitting? Um, we're trying to discipline that exercise by tying any and every factor we examine to some type of economic fundamental. And so in the space in which, you know, I like to think we're working in, any sort of machine learning AI, which is, which is really fancy speak for, for statistics at some level, um, has to be disciplined by the economics. Phil? No, I agree. Uh, right now, I think there's two areas where it seems to be working pretty well, which is high frequency. And then also, it seems that at the macro level, trying to model macroeconomics around the world seems to be working pretty well there. Mm -hmm. But it does open a whole can of worms to data mining again. Uh, after you find something, can you come up with a story for it? Yeah, of course you can. I think I heard Cliff Asner say that if momentum was the reverse from what it was, would we still trade it? Of course we would. We just come up with a new story. So if we have more and more anomalies found with machine learning, we're going to have more and more stories. It's going to be, it's going to be tough to identify what's real and what's, what, what's not. But an organized, structured approach to tying your hand behind your back, in essence. Yeah, exactly. I, I think an, I think an X, some X anti-discipline is critical. Right. Yeah. This might not be the scope of um, your research, but have you noticed any um, patterns of, across the anomalies that survived your robust testing? So why would an anomaly survive, and why would anomaly not? Is there any reason why certain anomalies that survived, from your perspective, has done that, and what are the implications for um, investors who are looking to find, obviously, surviving anomalies from, if you can share any thoughts on that? So, so I tried to touch on that in the talk and in the paper by linking um, actually not anomalies that survive across all three areas, but anomalies that uh, change between the first half of the century and the second half. Um, by tying, tying them to economic fundamentals, right? So, so in the first half of the century, we, we really see anomalies that are driven by tangible investment and equity financing at a time when tangible investment and equity financing was responsible for growth. And in the second half of our sample, right, we, we see those anomalies disappear and the rise of new anomalies that are driven not by tangible investment, but intangible investment, and not by equity financing, but total financing at a time when innovation and technological progress really ramped up in terms of intangible investments, and at a time when debt usage increased threefold, uh, from the medium firm being unlevered to the median firm having a debt-to-value ratio of over 30%. And so it's those linkages that we want to explore a little bit deeper. I don't, I don't want to lean too heavily on those correlations at this point. It'd probably be premature. Phil's comments on the pre-sample, in-sample, post-sample were very um, interesting and eye-opening. But I think that um, some of the earlier comments, I wonder if Phil has something um, similarly interesting to say about when you just move the start of the sample date by one year or two years, when you just move that a little bit, and how much, how dramatically that influences the anomaly returns, um, that was uh, quite stark. Yeah, I'll be honest, I didn't spend any time at all looking at that in the last four days. I, it wasn't, to me, the, the, the key part, but I agree, it's worrying, right? That if you just roll things back a little bit more, it doesn't work as well. Uh, I'd, have to, I'd want to check how many observations there are for some of these anomalies, because I do think sample size and the size of the firms, if you suddenly shift or change what it looks like, it can have a big impact. 
But anomaly is also incredibly noisy. And there's, yeah, it seems like there's a few bad years back in the mid-60s. I have no idea what's, uh, if it's random luck or if it's just there's nothing there. I, I don't know. Right. Yeah, I like that test. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right, because before we did that, you know, Phil's spot on. There's changing sample con composition concerns. But even, even more generally, I mean, just, just all of the econo structural economic changes in the 60s and 70s, I mean, think about, right, the oil prices in, in the 70s, are, are enough to, to, to suggest that there are structural changes in, in tastes or risks. But but you don't have to tweak these sample periods by much to just blow things up very quickly. And again, I, 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 don't, I don't attribute that to anything ill-advised on behalf of researchers, but that's just sort of an unfortunate consequence of the way we do research. We don't do what the life sciences, some of the life sciences do, which is submit for grant purposes, for example, or publication purposes, an ex-ante uh, list of the hypotheses we're going to test. That binds us, as Chris was mentioning earlier, but it's maybe something we should be thinking about given the nature of our observational studies. And Michael, as, a, as a, someone who has a, a presence in the editorial uh, realm of our profession, this must be, you know, the file drawer problem has been around forever. But, you know, the, the other element that is uncontrollable perhaps is that academics get, idea, get, get ideas from industry, just like industry oh, gets yeah. uh, get ideas from, in fact, this center exists in some sense to stand in the plenum between industry and practice. How do you think about that as an editor? And remember, I mean, data mining is like, you know, in, 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 in doing research based on the research of others is like kissing somebody. Once you kiss them by associative property, you kiss everyone else that they've ever kissed. So uh, how do you think about data snooping uh, when you're reading the work of others? In an entirely different way, having heard that analogy. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, you know, I could have written this paper on any subject on capital structure research, on investment and financing frictions, this problem persists throughout uh, social science research. It's, it's not unique to asset pricing by any stretch. I, I guess I actually take an optimistic view that we're having the discussion now, and it's really at the fore. Um, and so I think there's progress in the right direction to mitigate these types of problems. How long it takes and how much progress we'll make uh, t time will tell, but I think we're, we're moving in the right direction. And, and perhaps focusing on out-of-sample data sets, which is a big emphasis. Yeah, I think so. Had, uh, that's where certainly we as a center can continue to play a role. You've alluded to before, and it may not be of interest to institutional investors, but what if you were just to focus on small caps and ignore everything else? Um, would the, the glass being almost completely empty change to being almost full in certain instances? Sorry, I, I couldn't catch the last part. Oh, um, so, so, so would, would, would the graph, would the gla glass become uh, more? Uh, if we uh, just focused full, on small firms, small firms yeah. so that's a good question. We actually haven't looked, and the reason is in part because of uh, Phil's comment, which is very popular. What, what we have done is we've, we've tried to homogenize the sample across eras to account for the implicit bias towards relatively larger firms in the early era. But it's very easy to look at. We can absolutely do that. Thank you for the suggestion. You increased your uh, sample size from 700 to 1,500 firms, and you've used uh, book to market as a value. Like, there are very large firms that don't have any book value, but they are traded at a very high PE multiple. How did you adjust for, like, a tech company versus uh, integrated services bank versus a pure play asset manager, because their valuations would be very different? OK, so. I did almost no adjustments, but I want to be clear on what I did do. Uh, what, I, what we did was we first went from all firms, where we've got, say, 6,000 firms in the universe in any given month, and I said, no, let's just go to the largest 1,500. Throw the rest away, and then sample 700 from there. If book to market's bad for some of those firms, it's not informative, that's going to work against me. Right? It's not going to help find the anomaly. Uh, it's going to weaken it, which is what we see. But is that going to be a problem when I repeatedly do this thousands of times over? I hope that would wash out, because it's not, it shouldn't be systematic that there's a big problem with value for a large number of firms. It's going to happen. There's going to be problems. You can give me examples, I'm sure, of firms where it makes no sense. But there's going to be 90% or more firms where it makes a lot of sense. 
And so I'm just hoping that the simulations, by doing it over and over again, I wash those out. Given that uh, market participants are still exploiting these and making money on them in some, uh, in some areas, do you think that um, perhaps the payoffs are now in higher moments? And the second part of the question is, is the horizon maybe changed? I think that what's, yes, yeah, so people, some people are still trading possibly even these anomalies that you see. But investors have got smarter about how they trade. So if the anomalies disappeared from large firms, can you still trade the small firms? Yeah, you can, but you need maybe a bit more skill. I think Andrew Ang was at this conference a couple of years ago suggesting you could trade even the pink sheets with some skill. Uh, so maybe investors are getting smarter, and they're saying, well, we've got to work out how to trade the small firms more effectively, how to hide our trades so that we can still exploit existing anomalies. And then there's a reason that people like me have a job. Right? We've got to come up with newer anomalies or whatever we want to call them. We have to, it's constantly evolving. That's, that's the nature of the market. That's what makes it so fun. It's not just here's the factors that were laid out 30 years ago and you have to use them. It's about how can you innovate? How can you come up with new factors and new ideas? So one thing I would add is that um, data snooping isn't confined to the first moment or the second moment or, or any, right? It, it, it actually infects the entire distribution and the entire moment generating function. So that, I'm not sure that's what you were getting at per se, but you, you do have to be careful. There, there's no way around the problem by focusing on different moments, I guess is my point. The heart of my question is, I think a lot of investors incorporated these based on mean performance, but perhaps it's not the mean that you're gonna exploit going forward. So maybe it's part of it's a different application of the phenomenon mm -hmm may make it continually exploitable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, although the, then the time series issue is well, we fit the GFC, mm -hmm. which, which you heard about earlier. Yeah, yeah, it's a challenge. Any more questions? Please join me then in thanking our presenter, Michael Robertson, asset pricer from Morton, and Phil Davis. Thanks, guys.